The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Dash Technology Group, ABN 93603 824 835, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to Your Next Client Is You, an ensemble podcast series dedicated to revolutionising financial advice practices with technology. Each episode, we're peeling back the layers of tech implementation, guided by the real-life experiences of a diverse group of advice practitioners. Whether you're tech-savvy or just beginning, they've been where you are, researching, choosing, and triumphing in the tech maze. So, are you ready for insights and inspiration to revamp your practice? Then let's dive in. Are you looking to introduce unprecedented efficiency in your practice? Dash solves the entire spectrum of advice delivery, allowing you to streamline your practice in ways you haven't been able to before. Automate your execution from customized websites to CRMs, modeling, and SOA generation, executed straight into the Dash investment platform. We offer an array of in-house apps and collaborate with third-party vendors to bring you the best solutions. Curious about what your peers have accomplished in their practices with Dash and our integration partners? Have a listen to some practice insights that are sure to get you thinking. Hello and welcome to this very special Ensemble podcast mini-series where we're going to apply the five-stage advice process we all know so well to actually help us select the technology we use to serve our clients. Now, we're gaining these insights through the experience of advice practitioners from within the Ensemble network, along with some insights from some experts within Dash. I'm Peter Dumentitis, and the guests joining me here today are Andrew Grinsell from Cooey Wealth Partners and Courtney Walker from Fox and Hair. Welcome, welcome, folks. Thank Thanks you. For having nice to be here. Awesome. Now, this is episode four of the tech series, and we're focusing on the implementation stage. You know, we've sort of selected the technology partner or partners, <laughs> as we'll find out soon, uh, and this is all about uh, rubber hitting the road, which... We'll hear, I'm sure, but I figure this is probably the hardest part of it all. Um, it may seem hard to pick one, but it's even harder to implement it. Now, before we dive into that, I think it's worth us just touching on your respective sort of background experience, in particular when it comes to project management. That's what these things are, right? When we're rolling out these tech, massive tech projects, it's either project management or change management. Andrew, do you have any of that in your background? Do you have any training or experience in that? No, nothing uh, Nothing specific to change management or project management. No, and I'm assuming that's the same for yourself, Courtney. Is that right? Yeah, that's spot on. So, you know, very familiar with the advice process, not so familiar with change management specifically. Right. And now I, I figure, though, there is potentially some major projects you've done before. I think, Courtney, you've mentioned to me that you've had to roll out projects before. Is that the case? So this is more like a experience via doing sort of history. Is that fair? Exactly right. Yeah. So very much um, sort of projects and planning and implementation, uh, but less sort of bringing the team on the journey and, you know, uh, making sure they're across what's going on. And would that be the same for you, Andrew? I had some sort of very minor experience with bringing X-Plan into a practice about 15 years ago, but uh, a lot more simple when it was sort of a, just a four-person business uh, compared to what we're in today. Absolutely. And and probably like it really is just a so, like a siloed system then too, right? Back then it was just like, here's your one system, roll it out of the practice, didn't require many layers of complexity or overlap. So I imagine- I don't think I even knew what an API was back then, so it was very different. <laughs> all these codes and all these things I've got to know, right? I just need to learn how to use the thing. I completely Absolutely. agree. Completely agree. So now we have- cover this in previous episodes, but just to ensure the listeners on the same page with us, let's just quickly touch on um, the type of technology solution you're looking for. So, Andrew, what was the catalyst for you and what was the systems you guys were doing as part of this project? Yeah, so Kui Wealth Partners is part of a, a broader business, the Kui Group. And uh, what we had previously was a different CRM for the Wealth Partners business, which is the financial advice business. Another one for mortgages, another one for property, another one for accounting. So that meant that we had siloed information across all these different areas. 
double entry of data, no information sharing, no insight on the end-to-end customer journey so or client journey. So we really had to look for a CRM that was actually going to be able to cater for everything across the whole business, which then ended up with us going down the path of using a dedicated CRM that doesn't have a lot of the uh, things that we need in financial advice, like your modeling software, your product research, your document generation, and all the things you expect in an X plan or an advisor logic. Uh, so we actually en- ended up implementing all new um, technology across the whole advice delivery um, side of things in the business. Wow. So so really lost your mind there for a moment and made a big call about doing right across the business. That's a huge project. <laughs> yeah, well, um, big project. Absolutely. Yeah, well, this is fantastic. So we'll dive into those details. So Courtney, for you then, what type of tech solution were you guys looking for as you embarked on the project? Yeah, so our tech solution journey, I guess, was was quite different from Andrew's. We work with a younger demographic of clients, so we don't do sort of any retirement advice at, at Fox and Hare. And dealing with the younger def- demographic, naturally, they would like to be able to sort of connect with us in a more tech savvy way. So we were finding that, you know, the normal email and, and sort of back and forth via email wasn't quite um, working how we wanted it to work. So we were looking for a, a better way to connect with our clients. Um, with a more seamless sort of holistic approach, I suppose. And we wanted something that would connect with our existing software um, that could integrate well, that would allow us to have some customization so that it would still look like box and hair. And we also wanted something that, that would allow us to sort of work with that tech solution. So uh, I guess get advice from them, say, this is what we're trying to do. Can we do that? Yeah, okay. And so as part of your, and and the listener will have already heard this, but as part of your exploration, you sort of parked the advice production, you know, CRM modeling sort of stuff aside and went, okay, this is the thing we're going to do now. Exactly. Um, yeah. We were really focused on, on the client experience. Yeah, cool. Um, and so to that end, just so everybody's um, up to date, then the tool you ended up picking, Courtney? For us, it was yeah. high prosperity. And and the very long list of tools, <laughs> Andrew, you ended up picking. What was the batch that you that you ended up rolling out? Yeah, so we ended up with Fin three six five as the CRM because it is built on the the Microsoft Dynamics sales platform, which can be used across other parts of the business. Yep. We then connected that up with uh, My Dash, and uh, that then gives us access to their SOA generator. We use Product Rex, we use Omnium, we use Dynamic Docs, we use Chant West, and we use Buoyant for modeling. Okay, very good. Oh wow! So yeah, there's a bit there. Yeah, there is, yeah. there is, um, but not unusual to be honest. Yep. Um, not unusual at all. So you guys have sort of selected your chosen supplier, and I'll start with you here, Andrew. Then you've got to then roll it out. You've got to embed yep. it in the business. There's a number of steps to that. What was the first part? Was it the training or was it the data? What was the thing you felt you needed to embark on first? Very first thing was to actually work out our implementation plan so uh, and have somebody responsible for that. So quite fortunate that our power planning manager uh, is quite tech savvy uh, as well. So we we had our power planning manager, Jason, uh, sort of step into the role of leading the project across all business lines, not just Kiwi Wealth Partners, but across property, accounting, mortgages, really just making sure that we had that one person who um, was championing this then uh, set about putting together a plan. So we had a, a Gantt chart with everything that needed to be done, who was responsible for it, what the order and the time frame was going to be, and uh, sort of map that out. And we knew it was going to take six months to be able to get it all in place to the level that we want it to be at. And um, yeah, once we sort of had that that all mapped out, we then you know, knew what we had to do and got started with introducing it to the team before moving on to training. Um, yeah, quite a lot to it. Yeah, there is. And I guess I'm sort of, um, I'm also curious about, and we'll we'll dive into the data element in particular for you, yeah. because I'm betting that was a huge task, um, mm-hmm. if for no other reason than it's coming from so many different sources. But the actual process, so when you've got so many that you're then implementing, I'm curious, did you sort of s- sit back and go, all right, blank sheet of paper, revisit all our processes. Like, how did you sort of stop this from being a three-year project, which, you know, it could be if you went too deep into too many elements. How did you try and manage that? Yeah, so 
We knew there was a lot of data to come over and we did bring on a data analyst intern at the time as well to help support Jason through that process. Really, it was a case of trying to attack it in January, which is traditionally a quieter month for us. Yep. Uh, so we sort of switched it off where we said, right, there's no new data going into the old CRM. Uh, and then we're going to start the process of exporting the data from uh that existing CRM. I think we ended up with 236 spreadsheets that came out of the former CRM. And it, it was quite horrible actually trying to stitch it together and bring it back into the new CRM because you'd end up with uh, this spreadsheet where we, we'd have like the, a property asset, its name on one spreadsheet and an identifier. Then a different spreadsheet would have its um, its address. A different spreadsheet would have the value. Another one would have the property expense. The massive job in bringing all that together. So we just made sure that we had people who were just dedicated to working on that and they weren't doing any other business as usual activities. We also took one of our client support team members away from doing your normal file builds and all that sort of stuff and gave them to to Jason to um, really support him and make sure that they were focused on it. And we just worked through uh, you know, one item at a time. So it'd be like, all right, today we're getting income in for our clients. You know, Tomorrow we'll do expenses. And then we moved on to assets, liabilities, and worked our way through. Once we were done with advice, went on to property, went on to accounting. Fortunately, a lot of the same information exists across the same business lines. So you know, if you've got all the client's key details, it's no different whether or not you're pulling it from the property CRM, the accounting CRM, the mortgages CRM, or, or the financial planning CRM. A lot of the, the data is the same, but you'd have to decide which source of data is it that you're going to take as the source of truth, because obviously you could end up with some conflicting data if yes. things haven't been updated, like rents have changed, property values, all that kind of stuff. We decided to run with the financial planning side because financial planning does have the regular contact with clients and the regular updates. So we sort of th- saw that as being a bit more contemporous and ran with that rather than saying, well, we'll get the information from accounting or we'll get it from mortgages where maybe mortgages are you know, been two years since they did a mortgage review or something. Yeah, and it's look, it's an interesting. I mean, two hundred and thirty six spreadsheets aside from hey. the poor person dealing with yeah. that. Aside from yes, you know, bless them, they obviously yeah. need a holiday after yeah. doing this. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think is it's it's sort of like the the physical manifestation of the challenge you're trying to overcome, which is you want to have one view of your client, like you want your client to feel like this is seamless, and and how can it possibly feel seamless if from your perspective. They exist in all of these places, you know. So I think it's an interesting yeah. representation of that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you want to try and avoid these conversations with clients where they might be speaking with a mortgage broker and the broker's asking them, oh, you know, what's the rent on your investment property? And then the client's saying, well, we just had that conversation two weeks ago with our financial planner. I was like, don't you have it? Siloing the information wasn't ideal. So it was really you know, wanting to bring it all together and be able to avoid that. And the clients know that it is seamless. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So that's Clearly, like the base is going, okay, let's get all of that, you know, from from the point we go from here, let's have a an approach on data and, and get that consistency. How about then the processes you use? Because assuming that that it's different across different you know, elements of the, the business, yep. then clearly the processes had to change a fair bit, I'm betting, that people were using. Uh, they did and actually brought in another piece of technology to uh, be able to document and run uh, our policies and procedures. So we brought in uh, Trainual, uh, which yep. is a digital learning platform, uh, and basically started from the top down and worked through everything and uh, worked out you know, who was going to be responsible for what, uh, and at what stage different things happened. In terms of uh, the way we engage our clients, none of that sort of really changed. So our processes and you know, policies and procedures around that, it was more so around the data and the file builds and the integrities and uh, that element of it that did change. Uh, but then, of course, bringing in new technology, you, you know, modeling systems, you're going to have new assumptions and different things. Maybe there's certain assumptions you've got to key into your new modeling software that didn't exist in the old one. So you still do have to go through and document well, what are our standard approaches to all of this yeah, and that that did take a bit of time. But I'm betting probably caused some healthy debates too. You know, anytime you've got to work that out, it does cause people to have to, if if there's a differing view within the business, it causes that debate, which I think is a great thing. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always open to questioning. Why are we doing this the way that we have? Just because we've always done it in the past doesn't mean that we should continue to do something in a particular way. Uh, and uh, we've got some some good advisors in our team with experience from. Uh, plenty of different firms, be, be that institutional or boutique. So uh, we want to learn what's worked for them in the past. And if they've got a different way of doing things, we'll certainly look at it. 
Yeah, yeah, awesome. Now, Courtney, so for you then, there's a couple of layers that have sort of streamlined this process for you guys. For starters, my understanding is you are the dedicated person that got assigned this project. So that helps. You can expend some energy focusing on it. Is that correct? Yeah, that that's spot on. Um, in saying that, though, um, the team was quite involved in the planning process. So I was going to say it was quite similar, similar to Andrew, and then he spoke about the 200 plus spreadsheets, <laughs> and I went, no, nope, not quite similar. Um, but yeah, we, we sort of broke the planning phase down into different sections, and I think we started by saying, okay, well, what do we want the experience to look like? And the team was really involved in that. So they were able to think of ideas and, oh, it might be nice if, um, you know, we call the member in this situation or if we sent them a gift or, you know, what does it actually look like and how can we use the tool to um, create that experience? Then it sort of moved forward to, um, I guess, more of a structuring type phase. So, okay, we know what we want it to look like. How is this going to work from a process? Who's going to do the first step, but the second step? Yeah. What's it going to look like from a team point of view? How is it going to integrate into our current workflows? So, so that was sort of the next step. Then it was about going back to the team to say, okay, this is what we've discussed. This is what it's going to look like when we implement it and getting them really familiar with the view of that. Okay. Um, and I should also say that we're we're not fully implemented yet, so we're sort of sort of still going on on the journey. The other component that we're doing is little tests. So we're getting a few a few of our clients involved and sort of saying, "Hey, you know, we're going to be rolling out this new process. Do you want to be involved in in testing out how it's going to work?" So that's sort of a little um, testing the water for both the team and our members to make sure things are working before we roll it out across the whole business. And it's an interesting um, counterpoint, isn't it? Because from, you know, your project was probably very much about change for the client experience. Correct. As opposed to, yeah. Andrew, yours is very much the, the, the machine, right? The internal machine that's working and let's get that humming and hopefully the client yeah. really doesn't notice much difference aside from it maybe being better or smoother or easier, um, but it's not significantly changing it. So it's, it's um, the minute you get, the clients actively involved in the new does require a bit of a different um, approach. I'm curious when you do when you're doing that testing, like have you actively sought out very comfortable with tech, not so comfortable with tech? Like how have you approached that of the people that you get to do the testing? So about 12 months ago, we actually did a focus group with our clients. So a group of um, it was 12 clients in the end that we knew were quite vocal, would be happy to give us their own honest opinion <laughs> about what they wanted to see from Fox and Hair. And so naturally they were the ones that we reached out to for the testing to say, hey, you know, we, we heard your feedback. We're now going on the journey to implement that feedback. Would you be happy to be part of this? So, and, the, and they are, they're really excited. So, And it's an interesting thing with clients and change. Um, we're going through a a large project ourselves at the moment. It's a similar sort of client portal style, and we're about to roll it out with a, a beta test. And what we're the language we're using is we love it if you could try and break this thing. So to sort of give them permission, you know, it's yeah, it's thought they're not tentative and like, oh, I don't know how to do all this. Or like, it's like, no, 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 we need you to really mess it up. Come on, give it your yeah. best because that's how you can smooth it out for everybody else, exactly. and you'll get great feedback because they'll feel like it's okay to say. I didn't understand what you meant by, you know, download this thing or upload this thing or, you know, so I think giving the client a license to go a bit nuts, I think is really powerful. Now, I'm a bit curious, actually. So, Andrew, you've got quite a, I mean, how many total staff were were, were sort of going to be impacted by this? Uh, about 30 okay. staff across the business, yeah. Okay. So, and and probably quite a breadth of, of both um, age demographic or experience or, you know, tech approach. So I'm, I'm curious um, what their response was broadly in terms of, you know, enthusiasm, you know, scepticism, weariness. Did you have the, the spread of it or did you find that everybody was pretty keen? I think it was most um, sort of the, the responses or the enthusiasm varied more so based on role rather than background or experience. And I, I think that's because everybody had a different level of, of impact from going through these CRM changes. So 
for example, um, the accounting team, it wasn't anything really major. They still have zero to, to go and do the majority of their work. Um, it, you know, FIN 365 just becomes the new CRM for them or yeah. you know, Dynamics 365. Um, the, the, the wealth partners or the financial advisors uh, certainly had the biggest impact because it was new CRM, new modeling, new document generation, new risk insurance, uh, new super product research. Um, so, you know, whereas in the past they might have been used to a all-in-one solution like a advisor logic or a, an X plan or a coin, it's actually going to say to them, no, no, now we're going to have like six or seven different pieces of software to do the same job that one bit of software previously did. Um, that was quite, uh, obviously required a lot of engagement and explanation. We had to just take them through and explain, look, you know, we're, we're going to get something that doesn't try to be everything. It just tries to be a CRM and does it really well. We're then going to go to some modeling software that just does modeling. It's all they want to do and they do it well. And working through that, um, so, and what we need is the wealth partners need to have at least some sort of um, foundational knowledge across all of those areas. You, you can't not know how to interpret the modeling or not know how to use the CRM. They don't have to be necessarily experts at every one of them, but they've got to have at least some foundational knowledge. So it was hardest for them. Um, support team, they were, they were on board. They're, they're just happy to help and jump in and do everything. But um, yeah, really, it's the, I, I think, yeah, the, the financial advisors or wealth partners, as we call them, um, it was certainly the more challenging part because they're also worried about the time it's going to take them away from dealing with their clients. Yeah. Yeah. And and even if it's if it's the time in them doing their background research or whatever they're doing, if that feels like it's taking longer and it means it's stretching out the process and they're conscious of the, you know, the deliverabilities and, you know, all that sort of stuff, it can really feel like, why are we doing this? You know, this feels like it's a step backwards. So it is it's it can be tough to manage, um, for sure. I'm curious then whether you had any um you know, whether you were signed any sort of, you know, tech, I don't know, like mini champions rather than the project. So you mentioned, I think it was Jason, your power planning yeah. manager sort of was responsible for the whole thing, but did he sort of like pick some people that he sort of got on board <laughs> that maybe picked it up a bit faster and got a bit of energy in the team about the tools? Well, what we did is we, we actually had weekly catch-ups with everyone to talk about their experience with news, using the new software. And we were deliberate in asking the right questions when we were hosting these catch-ups to make sure that not only were the challenges or the the problems, which are inevitable, uh, you know, come up, but also that the, the good things. So, what's worked well? Like, what have you been able to achieve with this software that you couldn't do with with other software that we had? And actually working through that, um, so that there is you know a, a bit of excitement about it, and people can see that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Because as I said, like inevitably there are challenges. You'll find something just doesn't work, or it doesn't work the way you used to it working. So. Um, you've got to be able to work through that and go, yes, you know, we understand that it's going to take time, but look, there's, there's all these good things that are happening. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, um, you know, the regular check-ins make a, make a difference because it doesn't let it brew for too long, yeah. you know, so if there's frustration, yeah. then there's a quick, a quick resolution. Courtney, I'm curious, so for yours, what's interesting is you went away and did all this research and you're, okay, what are our options and realized something you already had was going to fulfill the need. So... I'm then curious whether you really had any change management challenges in that sense, because the team would have already been aware of the tool, you know? So was there any challenge of getting them enthusiastic about the implementation or the project? Yeah. So it is really funny. You're right. We we sort of went out to market and went, okay, what tool can we use? And and found out that a lot of the functionality we wanted was already in, in MicroSperity, which we were currently using very minimally. So... It was all about sort of maximizing our, our use of the tool. Our team, there's no real age differences in our team. So we're, we're a relatively young team. Um, and in terms of roles, I don't think there was a difference in response in terms of roles. Naturally, change is, is just something that people don't tend to like and that can yeah. be really scary for, for people. Um, where I think we did well in avoiding sort of a negative reaction was really um, taking the team on the journey as to why and and what the reason for the change was and getting their buy-in about, you know, uh, what are we doing well? What are we doing well? How can we improve our, our client experience? And their ideas were then coming to life when we were saying, okay, we're now going to roll out this new process. So it was more of a, a feel of excitement rather than nervousness or, or 
you know, oh gosh, I, I'm resisting the change. So yeah, what what is this thing, and why are we doing it? And it seems like a distraction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's an interesting thing too that um, I've seen in practices where if you can manage to facilitate that discussion before you even really embark on it, such that they've drawn out what the challenges are, then when you solve them with whatever the tech are, what tech is that you pick, then like you say, they're on board because it's like exactly. oh, fantastic, you're solving the problem. I highlighted, yeah, hey, you know, exactly. I think some of these things fall apart when we're solving a problem they don't believe they have, you know, so that's then a challenge, right? That's yeah. then it was like, wait a minute, I was doing fine. Why do I need this different thing? I'm curious whether there are any of the uh, silos, Andrew, for you that sort of hit that, that went, well, we were doing okay. You know, why can't we just be left to run along on our own? Did you hit it? Yeah, any probably more in, the, more in the advice side of the business because we had a CRM that, you know, was working for us, but it wasn't helping the rest of the business. And um, that's where, yeah, we did have some of those sort of questions come up. Uh, we were on Advisor Logic before. It's quite intuitive. It's easy to use. Um, it, it serves, you know, it's good, uh, mm. but it just doesn't necessarily serve the purposes for a multidisciplinary business. It is it is purely a financial planning CRM. So, mm. Uh, we had to sort of work with the advice side of the business to um, make everyone sort of realize that, you know, this is for the good of the, the business overall. And if all areas can work together better, you know, so if you can start from advice or workflow for the property team, because you've got a new interested, you know, or a client who should be going down the property path without having to send off emails, you can keep track, you can see what's going on across other parts of the business and understand your client. Uh, we had to sort of, you know, make sure we're working through, well, what are the benefits for those areas that, probably didn't have as much need of a change if they're being you know, a bit selfish and thinking about their own benefits. Which is yeah. natural, right? If you feel yeah. like you're plundering along and get a lot of work yeah. done and the clients are happy, it yeah. would be natural to go, wait a minute, why are you messing with this? So I think it's a yeah. it's a given, you know, it's a fair yeah. response. Yeah, um, absolutely. And look, we still saw challenges with any CRM. I think everybody's always, um, it's quite easy to focus on the challenges you have with any software and you sort of ignore all the good stuff that it's got and then you got to be really careful not to go out and start chasing solutions to only a couple of problems and ignoring all the good stuff that you currently have and potentially losing that when you make the switch. Yes, 100%. And I, and I mean, Courtney, I'm betting that's what happened for you guys. Yeah. Like you were looking at, hey, we could we could move or we could choose an alternative, but wait a minute, that thing we've got that we're not really using, that has lots of these features. Why would exactly we Exactly right. It? Yeah, exactly right. So yeah, there were definitely other things on the market, um, but we were worried about sort of losing some of the features that we found were already in our own backyard. So yeah, yeah, definitely. And that also we had um, go ahead. my prosperity in the uh, in the Kui Wealth Partners business, and I, I think what we found is that if we weren't making it a core part of our process, it just wasn't getting used. Um, so it was sort of, like you said, sitting there off to the side, Courtney, um, and not being used to its full extent. Uh, I think that was the challenge that we faced with it, is not making it part of our day-to-day and our, you know, every client interaction. And it's expensive. If you're not using it to, to the full extent, it is really expensive. Um, but I think it's well worth the money if you can use it to the full extent and you have sort of um, engaged clients. And I think that's true of like any piece of tech that we choose. And even like, I, you know, you'll engage with somebody who talks about newsletters and they see it as something that just goes out to the clients. It's like if it doesn't fit into your engagement plan, like if it doesn't fit into the yeah. journey you want to take on clients, it's going to be another thing you're paying for that you may not see value from, you know. So yeah. the the step and hence my question is a step about, okay, looking at the processes that are going to be using the the tech is part of that embedding it, isn't it? It's like, just let's make Absolutely. this part of what we're doing so that it's unavoidable. We get that value. Um, now, I'm curious, um, and Courtney, we'll start with you then, you know, each tech provider sort of approaches as either onboarding or training or, or resources quite differently. Is there anything you felt that, you know, My Prosperity had that really made the difference to, you know, help this thing you were embarking on was there tools that they had or or videos or anything like that or even people that you felt that could really that really added value to the to the rollout for you that's that's a really good question i think my prosperity was really bought into what we were trying to do um and they had sort of a couple of people within the business that were really helpful when we were saying hey this is what we want it to look like and they would sort of go yep great we can do that we can do that we can do that oh 
can't quite do that, but here's a workaround, which made it really easy for us to go, okay, well, we've got nine out of 10 boxes ticked here. Let's just dive in. Yeah. Um, My Prosperity also do some really great webinars. So weekly webinars that come out with, hey, did you know about this functionality or um, new functionality that's coming out? So they're quite responsive to feedback, which is really encouraging. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Andrew, you will have your t- you and your team will have experienced onboarding or resources across providers now across a number of different ones. You know, what were some of the things that some of them did that really stood out that you're like, wow, that added a lot of value? Was there anything that really sort of had an impact? Yeah, I think, uh, look, Fin365 are really good in that they have basically recorded videos on everything and they've set it out into um, different structures on, um, you know, start with um, you know, your introduction to your household forms and move through a whole lot of modules to really complete and finish it. Uh, we did have a part of our process where we selected a, um, a modeling software before Voyant uh, as part of this process and we lasted there about a month uh, because we worked out it just wasn't right for us once we got there. And one of the challenges we had with that bit of software was whenever we got stuck with something, uh, in a particular client scenario, their solution was, oh, join next week's live video training and we'll go through and we'll help you with it. Oh. But the problem with that is we're trying to complete the advice today to present to a client in a couple of days. And if we go and do that live training in a week's time with you and you'll fix it up for us, great. We'll then keep working on that client file. And I'm sure if we're going to get stuck somewhere else because we're all new to this and nobody in the business has used the software before. So we end up going through four weeks to be able to put together some modeling. And that's just, it, you can't do that in an advice business. So people expect things really quick these days. Um, you want to try and turn your advice around relatively quick. Obviously, we've got a lot of steps in due diligence we need to go through to provide quality advice, but it's a bit of a balancing act there. And um, you know, having to pick up and put down the modeling four times over where, because you're trying to model your first client scenario and there's no videos and no training guides, uh, it just, it doesn't work. So to have live videos, you can just click on, um, Voyant's really good with that. It's got inline help. So everywhere you're doing something, it you can actually click on what it is you're trying to do and it'll bring up the relevant video within that section without having to go hunting through a tutorial library to find it. So to have that on-demand help is, is really quite helpful. And it's interesting, particularly with modelling, I've got this uh, yeah. pet peeve with these tools where it's, oh, just play with it and you'll get yeah. to learn it. Yeah. No! Well, well, here's a workaround. That's the one that I... Uh, right. No, I don't want workarounds. I, I want it to do its job. Pick a ring. Yeah. Right. This is a yeah. tool that we're... Like it's, and it's a really specific tool. So, no, I don't want workarounds. Yeah. I want it to just do yeah. the job. Yeah. So, I'm right there with you on that. I think it's hard. So, then you've got... Um, you, so, you've got a few of them. Was there any any of the groups that sort of had somebody that really you know held your hand as you went through the process? Yeah, so Greg at Fin365 is great. So he actually joined our uh, team meetings every Thursday morning uh, for the first, must have been two months, uh, and actually you know, could sit back, hear the feedback, and uh, would often go away and hit record another video if there was something we were stuck on and then send it out to the whole business afterwards. So um, yeah, he, he was really good. Uh, and so too um, with, the, with the guys over at, um, at Dash with helping us connect uh, Fin365 to the My Dash portal for those other apps that we've used. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's um I'm really uh, I'm there yeah. with you because I I think the choose your own adventure thing is great, except anything more than one person using the tool, it's just not going to work, right? It's not going to. You need something that's easy to onboard on mass, and them just doing it via discovery, it's going to yeah. cause some random results and and will get messy. So I think at the downtime. Like right. if you've got, um, so we had uh, what have we got about eleven authorized representatives, and to have them all at the same time trying to figure out how to use a new CRM, document generation, modeling, and the time that it takes to familiarize yourself with it, where you know now we can probably put together some modeling in a fairly comprehensive scenario for, in forty minutes, forty five minutes, whereas back then it was probably taking us like two hours to get the same outcome because we we're just new at it. We're, yeah. There's a lot of trial and error. Yeah. Um, but the video certainly helps speed that up. I, I, I don't want somebody spending a whole day trying to model out a client scenario. Um, otherwise, costs of advice are just going to go through the roof. Right. You just couldn't charge yeah. enough. Like, no. That's, that's it. Well, we've, got to, we've got to leave value in it for the client and still yes. make it profitable for us. And it's, it's a fine balancing act that we have to work with. And particularly modeling where it is, it is perfect for tech. 
it's formulas for goodness sake. Like this is yep. not nuanced in the sense that it needs human emotion involved in it. It's very like it's it's numbers, adding them up, dividing them, yep. multiplying them. Like yep. come on, absolutely. You. So I'm with you. It should yeah. be much 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 easier. Um, so Courtney, for you guys, you've you know this is a narrower project for you guys. Um, I'm curious yep. whether you made a decision to pause ops for any period of time to sort of get people up on the new project or the clients or this, you know, have you made any decision like that to sort of make sure you didn't have any overlap or conflict with the old process and the new process? No. So in terms of any downtime, we'll just sort of keep, keep moving. There's definitely a bit of a J curve there, sort of like Andrew was um, speaking to where you've got your productivity is going to go backwards a little bit while the team learns okay, what do I need to do? What's the next step? How do I use this? Oh, I'm a bit lost with, you know, this section of of my prosperity. But I think, you know, after a couple of months, you just see that those gains and and the experience improve. And Andrew, I'm I'm betting that it's quite the reverse for you. You mentioned January and picking a timing for this so that it had less impact. Hmm. Um, Did that was that to the point of even like you might have been ready earlier, but you waited for a period where it was far less activity just generally for the business? It lined up pretty well. I think it was around November that we decided which CRM we were going to run with. And then we knew that we had uh, notification periods we had to provide to the existing CRM so they could then allocate uh, resources to be able to do the data extraction uh, for us. And then also with the new CRM, they needed time because they need to import at least a core level of data uh, in there. So that all sort of worked quite well. We actually would have started earlier in January, but obviously we needed uh, for you know, Fin365 for those guys to have their team back on because you know, not much happens in, in Australia before Australia Day. Uh, pretty much everything shuts down. So we, we were probably held back a week or so over where we would have wanted to be. But the timing was pretty good. It wasn't like, you know, we made a decision in June or July and we had to wait six months. So it was only a couple of months difference. But I think that's an interesting yeah. bit of insight for the listener is if you did happen to, if the timing did happen to be more towards the middle of the year, is what you're saying that you probably would have waited to a better time? Like you would have made yeah, there's a There's no way to do it in decision. June or July. And, yeah. uh, there's just, it doesn't, it wouldn't happen. Um, you know, I think you've got to, I don't think there's ever really going to be a, a perfect time because no. you're going to have client reviews spread out throughout the year, new client inquiry coming in, and people are going to have trigger events where they're going to reach out to you uh, outside of review cycle. So you're always going to have this situation, but nonetheless, January is just a bit quieter. People you know, are still on holidays. Uh, we had a few of our advisors away and some of the support staff, so we knew if there was less people trying to work at that time where data going into the old CRM wouldn't come to the new CRM, but the new CRM didn't have any of the data. We wanted to sort of minimize the number of impacted people and have less people mucking around with the data at that time as well. Right. Because that thing gets messy too. If there's been some work to clean something and then somebody jumps into the wrong one and yeah, absolutely. Well, 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 that's it. I mean, anyone who was, any clients we needed to give advice to uh, between the period of time where we said, right, that's our cutoff date on the old old CRM, any changes after that date won't come to the new one but you know we had three weeks before the new one was going to have any data imported into it well if you wanted to advise a client during that time it was a manual file build but then what happens when you start bringing the data across from the old crm and importing it are you going to start overriding that new file build you've just done with up-to-date information yeah it's a so it's, it's an important thing when yeah. particularly with the type of thing you're talking about with crm where this client data is having that conversation with them yeah the new and old providers and having a plan because it's going to happen. You, you yeah. can't avoid it, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be so, in a window where there's yeah, there will be. chaos. Yeah, yeah, yeah for yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think we got to a point where we, when we knew new data was coming in, we actually did an export from the new CRM for any clients that had updated their data. We pulled it out, imported the old data in, and then re-imported over the top the updated data. Uh just to make quite sure. a process, yeah. Because well, clients don't want to have to give you the same information again either. No, 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 no. And we don't want to ask them for it. No, and and I think because by doing that, what you're assuming is something's going to go wrong. And I think that's a valid assumption. Yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. just assume it doesn't Absolutely. quite work. What are the steps we could add that could make it, you know, that little bit uh, easier? I guess. Um, and I think 
we like you say, and this would be the case for both of you on betting. You can't you can't control an influx, a random influx of client queries. Like that's just nothing you can control about that. But you can control picking timing based on the activity you generate. Like we all know, holiday and be guaranteed that you'll get an influx of client queries. Correct. Yeah, Yeah. I I agree with that. There's some sort of notice board that goes out to clients when we all book a holiday, right? I'm convinced (laughs) there's some secret social media or something that they all know uh, for sure. Um, But I think, you know, we can control the way whatever cycle your business works on or the way you trigger reviews or whatever it is, you know what that is. And so making sure you work around or within that cycle yeah. is really important. Don't just ignore yeah. it and go, oh, whoops, we picked the biggest review yeah. months of the year. You know, That's it. And bring forward reviews if you yeah. can. So like, if you know, all right, we're going to do this in March, then go and get all your March reviews and bring them forward to February if you can. Yeah. yeah. Try and do that so you minimize the, um, the business as usual that's going to occur whilst you're implementing new technology. Absolutely. And we've, we've even done that. And, and for clients that that didn't work for, we then proactively moved it back. So it was one or the other, you know, they either picked an earlier one or a later and they're like, oh yeah, that's fine. You know, they were very relaxed about that. Yep. Um, But yeah, being proactive about it is important. Now, I'm curious that, you know, Courtney, you're partway through this, um, but I am curious if, you know, as you go, you've done the research, you're in the, in the middle of the implementation, does any part of you wish you'd done it sooner, you guys as a project? Like, does it feel like, oh, we could have done this a year ago, you know, we could have had value. It's just that it happened to turn up now. Yes and no. So about 12 months ago, we went through a bit of a process, sort of redoing all our foundational workflows Mm -hmm. um, and just making sure we had all of that down pat after going through a really big period of growth. Yeah. So now's a really good time to, I guess, build on what we've done over the last 12 months. So I think if we tried to do this 12 months ago, it just wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have gone smoothly because our our foundational processes weren't where they needed to be for the number of clients that we had. Yeah. So, yes, we would have loved to to implement this twelve months ago and, and give better experiences to our our clients, which is the purpose of this. Yeah, but it was really good that we sort of cleaned up the house, tidied tidied everything up. Um, and have had everyone really strong with our foundational workflow processes before building on that. Whereas, Andrew, for you, um, I know you've mentioned but before we hit record that you had an interesting timing with some new re- re- advisors you'd recruited before this, and so that yep. you, part of your wishes you'd started a, a, this earlier. Talk us through that and what impact that had. Yeah, so we uh, basically doubled our advisor numbers in uh, June 2022 and spent the best part of six months getting them all used to advisor logic and then said, right, now that you're used to that, uh, we're going to go and change it all on you and go to something different. So, but in saying that, you know, if, if you know, we were looking at it going, do we wish we had have done it earlier? Uh, the reality is we probably couldn't have uh, because I was directly advising at the time. Uh, I, I wasn't in the role that I'm in now, if we didn't have a power planning manager, we, the business wasn't as big, we didn't have the resources. So yeah. uh, unfortunately, there, there's no ideal world where it'd be, we've got fewer advisors, fewer clients to look after, but more resources. It just doesn't happen that way. I do think, though, that's an interesting um, insight for anybody out there that is going through you know, a bit of a rapid growth phase. And there are some practices that are experiencing, much like, much like both the businesses you're part of are involved in is is when you're hiring, you probably need to hire people that can cope with that change. Because yep. if you're growing fast, things just are going to change. They, you can't avoid it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, for us, we've hired quite a number of, of new staff members over the last six to 12 months. And in every interview we've had, it's been, okay, how do you cope with change? How do you feel about change? Um, and we've found people who want to be on that journey and are excited about growth and growing with the business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, we've done um, Prover profiling with everyone that we onboard. So it's disc profiling mm-hmm. uh, so that we can sort of understand the um, the way that people are sort of act and are motivated and um, we can sort of then see, you know, who is adaptable to change, who, you know, whereas who who prefers steadiness uh, which has yeah, certainly helped us as well. Yeah, and I think it's an. I mean, that's probably a flag for anybody listening that's thinking about one of these projects down the track. Is is some personality pro? Not that you let somebody go because they're not going to cope, but I think some 
some work where they better understand themselves and the way they're going to adapt to change and what that might mean and what their behaviours might be prior to embarking on a big project yep. um, could be really valuable. Absolutely. And as a manager, just being able to understand how to work with different members of the team, it's it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, and the, yeah, there's some really good ones out there that that use some language, and you can start to use in the practice of how somebody's behaving and how that's connected to their profile, and all of that can be quite powerful and less judgmental, I guess. You know, whereas yeah. sometimes it's like, why aren't you just doing this? Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it gives a language to describe that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious, then, you know, Andrew, for you, clearly one of the things that that got messy, for want of a better description, is the data. Yeah. Um, mm. and the extraction. You mentioned you had an intern um, that you sort of used as a data analyst. Would you do anything, di- like if you could go back and wave a magic wand, is there any way that you'd approach that differently, um, you know, in you know, for somebody else that you'd recommend they hire somebody full-time for a certain period or anything like that, that you'd approach that sort of data and, and data extraction and cleanup process differently? Yeah, look, I think we probably could have put some more resources into it and it would have saved us uh, and provided a bit more efficiency for the advisors who still had to do quite a bit of file tidy up because the the import wasn't perfect. So every time they've gone to pick up another client file, they've had to probably go back and look at old fact finds and go, is actually, is it correct? So uh, look, with the benefit of hindsight, we probably could have put more resources into that side of things and it really had somebody who's a specialist in that that area i, I think fin365 actually offer that service we probably should have taken it up so but yeah that's the benefit of hindsight you, know, you, you live and learn and move on you absolutely do i think we probably all under underrate how difficult data is how difficult it's to deal with find transfer you know any of those things um is certainly part of the challenge is there anything Although I'm curious, though, just taking that that thought through, you've now got this wonderfully squeaky clean and, and really quite fulsome data set now, and you're sort of all humming on the same page. Is there any opportunities you've therefore seen or or anything that's come out of that that maybe was a bit of a surprise but is really exciting in terms of having everybody using the same information? Yeah, we're starting to get certainly better um, business intelligence often. So we really do have a better understanding now of our cost to serve, uh, the resources that we put into looking after our clients, that's certainly improved. Our ability to segment clients and identify clients for um, you know, any maybe any regulatory changes or in advice opportunities that have come up, yeah. uh, just that basically the way that the CRM now works is just a massive database. And as long as the data's in the system somewhere, we can create all sorts of reports off it and blend it together and you know, spin it up into Power BI reports uh, and all sorts of things to really better understand and better understand our clients who maybe aren't getting enough attention as well. Um, the, the quieter clients, that you know, the, the less vocal ones um, that... We probably need to be making more of a conscious effort to reach out to because um, you know, they might not be putting their hand up when they need help. Yeah. Uh, so we can we can better understand that because we're getting better tracking of you know uh, when when did we last have a phone call with a client or have a meeting with a client or all sorts of things like it's all all there on a dashboard now to to understand um, you know, at a business level at a divisional level at a client level. And so similarly, you know, for you, Courtney, is there anything in the way where where you've got to now that you do differently that you'd sort of think, oh, you know, I know we've embarked on it this way, but, you know, I'd change it slightly, you know, if we had to have another go or if you were to suggest to another advisor they go down this path? Where we're at now, I'm feeling pretty comfortable. Um, One thing I learned from sort of last year when we were going through our workflow changes was we were really good on the communication front and the team were really across what was going on from a communication perspective. They felt quite supported. But we forgot about really good training. <laughs> so so it was all about, yes, okay, communication, but the actual training and showing them what to do and how to use it was, um, I guess, put to the side in favour of communication. So... This time round, we're very conscious of making sure that actually there's some steps involved in making sure that they're trained properly and not just once or twice, but ongoing. So that's sort of what I would say from a feedback point of view at the moment. 
Certainly, um, you know, it's funny. I think, you know, when you're doing something like this, you're a business owner, you're a project manager and a thing, and you go, well, we've shown you that. You're like, we've shown them once, surely you know. Yeah. Like, it's just a natural thing. We, yep. Yeah, but we trained you on that. Whereas I think, you know, Andrew, your take would be the value you guys must have got out of Trainual. Did I not yep. saying that right? Which I'm betting yep. is, is almost like an intranet. Like, it's just going to host how to do things forever. Into- yeah, absolutely. But, you know, videos, uh, we can have you know, quizzes and all sorts of stuff on the back of training content. So, and you can, you know, re release it to everyone every year to make sure that they go over it again. And yeah. it, it certainly helps as opposed to just having some policies and procedures sitting somewhere on an intranet site that you share once and, you know, expect everyone to follow perfectly. It, it just doesn't work like that. So, uh, it needs to be ongoing and you, you do need to review and update these things and assess people on the changes over time. Yeah, well, look, we're the same. I and mean, we, we've used something called Guru, which is like our, our IP. It's our intranet. And, and what we've found is interesting is some people will, op- and even if it's just not even, even if it's not a video, it's just a, the steps they've got to undertake for something. Some people will have that open for like the first month. You know, every time they do that thing, they're just going to have it sitting there, which is an interesting training lesson. Because clearly the first training for those people, some people learn by doing and repetition, you know, where others can watch the training and go, yeah, I'm good. You know, it's everybody's so different, aren't they, in the way that they learn and the way they're going to absorb this information, um, you know, so we've sort of got to be ready to adjust for that. Exactly. And and some people are reluctant to ask. So yeah, that's having a good really point. good training videos, et cetera, is really important because some people want to feel like they're on top of it or feel like they're... Um, bothering you if they ask about it. They just want to sort of dive in and do it. So Now, I've got one here that um, sort of, I mean, Courtney, your project, while has required a lot of effort and attention and, and the team were involved, hasn't sort of been the mammoth scary tech. <laughs> no. <laughs> the most people we bark in or the what, like horror movie scary that Andrew's team embarked on. So, Andrew, I'm curious – you know, many advice practices move licensees more than they move tech. Like they're happy to chop and change who they're licensed with rather than tech because they see the whole migration as just such a huge headache. What would you, having sort of done this and it be hard, you know, and you've had to put a lot of effort, what would you say to them if they're hesitating? I think the decision's got to, you know, take a step back and actually you know, have a look at your business and what it is that you're trying to achieve and... You know, sometimes you'll find, like Courtney did, that your existing technology actually does it. And you know, making um, a change to the way you use it can be a lot easier than bringing in something new. Um, I'd certainly encourage everyone to sort of just actually note down what your objectives are. It's a bit like financial planning. You know, <laughs> write down your goals and objectives, have a look at your current position, and then put together a strategy to get there. Now, if now, and we say this with clients, if you keep doing what you're currently doing and it's not going to achieve your objectives, then you need to make a change. Yeah, It's the same thing with your technology. If your technology is not going to achieve your business and client goals and objectives, time for a change. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, I mean, you could almost argue that anything that is going to have a massive impact is going to hurt initially. Like it's just the way things work, you know, it's just how it is. Nothing Nothing is super easy is going to have a massive impact. It'll have some benefit. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. if you're really going for that significant shift, which is what you guys were doing, you know, siloed operations, bringing it together, making it a hub, um, you know, that's a massive thing. That's that's going to leave some bruises, you know, <laughs> it's, it's natural. Um, but facing them up front, I think, is is yeah. clearly what you did and is is really important. So I'm curious, Courtney, you know, is there any – sort of last tips you'd give to any practices out there, you know, to really sort of optimize the implementation of new tech, any tips, anything you did that ended up really adding value? Yeah. I mean, first and foremost, reach out to people in your network. So I had um, a customer manager at Dyson that gave me some support, some support and a change manager at Macquarie that I um, met with to sort of understand, you know, how can we help this change journey be as smooth as possible. Planning, sort of as Andrew touched on, we're financial advisors. We know how to write a financial plan. If you can try and restructure that into the change management process, really good. Another one that's probably a little bit out there, but don't be afraid to tell your clients that you're you're making the changes. Um, Set their expectations, even if it's not a client-facing change. 
uh, they might be interested and they would be understanding of the changes that you're making. So they're probably my top three tips, as well as bring the team on the journey. If absolutely. Yeah, but don't leave your team behind because it's there's no point. You'll just end up going back to the old, or they'll continue to use your, uh, the old tech. I've seen that happen. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, how about you? Any sort of tips or suggestions you'd make for somebody to really, um, you know, nail it if they're, they're looking to optimize the implementation of a new technology project? As I sort of touched on before, know exactly what it is you're trying to achieve. Work out a strategy and have somebody who's accountable in your practice for implementing it because uh, you know, if everybody's responsible, then nobody is. You need to make sure there really is someone who is is taking the ownership of it, especially in larger practices, um, to make sure that it is embedded uh, and implemented correctly and um, you know, structure that person's role and their KPIs and everything around that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's because it needs momentum, doesn't it? And it's so easy to lose that momentum when some everybody has everything else they're doing. If you fall back to your business as usual and your day-to-day job, unfortunately, it's never th- it won't be implemented as successfully as what it could be. Whereas if there's somebody who's solely focused on it, if that's possible in your business, uh, that certainly helps at all ensure that there is progress. Particularly at implementation, I think you could probably get through the earlier stages as sort of a side project. You could go, all right, I'm going to keep an eye on things. I'm going to do some research. I'll have a couple of meetings. But once you've picked... You've got to go all in, you know. <laughs> you just got to decide to get it done, right, and roll it out. Fantastic. Well, look, Courtney and Andrew, thank you so much for being so open with the process you've been undergone and still undergoing, um, and really generous with your time. I'm really confident there's going to be a whole lot of insight and help that it's going to give the listeners um, for either considering new tech or maybe they're in the middle of it and they're suddenly like, oh, we didn't think of that. We can get better at this implementation. So I really appreciate your insights and uh, I'll be speaking to you next time for the next episode. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having us. All righty, implementation. This is when it gets hard, folks. So we've got the wonderful Andrew Whelan back here from Dash. So, Andrew, it probably doesn't surprise you that the expressions change management and project management came up in this conversation. Mm. Would you say potentially those are some skill gaps that exist broadly for people, that it's when they're implementing these sort of projects, it's it really shows up that we're a bit less experienced in those things? Well, just not resourced for it, right? I think. Like you don't build a financial planning practice and then get a project manager no. necessarily. You don't know, no. maybe there are, but you know most of the time you guys – as you should be, are all geared up to deliver good advice. Yeah. But then when a big project comes along, you're kind of doing that part-time. Yeah. That's where things go south in any business is when you're doing things part-time. Because you're inexperienced yeah. at, yeah. at anything and that's going to be hard. And it doesn't have your full focus. No. So it's, um, it is challenging. But one of the things that we uh, that was mentioned is, um, I think by Andrew, is having a advocate internally. Right. So... Char- actually charging someone who's the most enthusiastic, ideally for us. Yes. <laughs> if it's on our side, the most enthusiastic, but even if it's the least enthusiastic person, if you win them over, right. then everything else is going to fall over. But having someone internally that everyone can go to first that can fly the flag yep. um, for the for the project, not necessarily for the the vendor. Yep. So we, we can fly our own flag, sure. but it's more about, no, no, when things get hard, there's someone in there reminding them that there is a business need that you are solving. You're not doing this for fun, not because yeah. it looks better, but yeah. because reminding everyone that you've got you had a problem and this is solving it. So that's really important. Yeah, look, and I think Courtney mentioned the same thing. And I guess you know we've all been to events where it's clear there wasn't an event manager, and it's a similar issue. Mm. You just need somebody that everybody can go to, yeah, and also somebody sort of playing traffic cop, you know, coordinating timing, all those sort of things. This it is a it's a thing in and of itself, you know? Yeah. And you've got the rest of the operation that's going to have to continue through this. And if you're a big enough business, I wouldn't even rule out getting a three-month contractor that that's okay. done this stuff before. That might cost you 20, I don't know, 25 grand, yep. like three months maybe, yep. you know, but you can go on with your business, right? You know? So the money, so you do, you would, what I would encourage you to do is weigh up, and we do this all the time when we have big projects, not around tech, but other things like yep. SFTs and, yeah, yep. other things that are not core to our business is sum up. Well, what if we 
lose a client through this or what if we, you know, so what if we earn less revenue or make less money or something happens and yes. weigh that up versus if we get someone in that can do this for us or can help, is that, that might be a hedge. And look, in this market too, there's a lot of practices out there that are getting that more in demand, you know, mm. they've got more meetings to have, mm. then, you know, if you take too much of your time on these things, yep. then it, it's directly lost income. Yeah. This is not vague lost income. No, this it's is direct. easy to measure. Yeah, absolutely. So, it's something to consider. Yeah, important. And I think, you know, Andrew mentioned then, you know, that they really mapped out, before they even, you know, kicked off the implementation, they mapped out the project. They really took a look at all the stages yeah. and what the steps were going to be. I'm... I'm guessing that would be unusual for most practices. How do you think, how do you see that working normally? Yeah, I loved hearing that, but my immediate reaction is we we should have done that or okay. could have done that. Yeah. Um, or, the, or the provider, depending on which particular which, module or who where it's facing. But yeah. if it was a dash, you know, part of it, what I would have um, preferred is at least the documentation because we've, we're the ones that roll this out professionally, right? Yes. So we have all the documentation and all the project plans just lying around. Right. So we, so I'd encourage them to, if you choose a new vendor, ask them for all the resort, not just the software, like, have you got any project plans? What did you do last year? What, ask the question, what's stuffed up? What's your worst implementation? What happened there? Right. Yeah. What didn't you do? Yeah. So there's a lot of knowledge, not just about the tech that you can pull out of. Um, your vendor um, yeah. to make sure that your rollout is as smooth as possible. Because there's so many moving parts in these things. So, what, yes. you know, talking about the worst implementation, that's not going to be about, oh, the tech stuff's up. That's just the way things rolled out. Yeah. Maybe staff ended up leaving or exactly. like all sorts of things can happen yeah. through these processes yeah. to understand how to best manage that yeah. and get your insights. You guys see so many of these. Exactly. Every You've day. got to be better at it than us at yeah. this. Yeah. You know, and, and having done project management in my background it's so different it's yeah. a different it's, it's a, a different, different roles it is yeah. it really is and we shouldn't necessarily think we can just pick it up mm -hmm. like that um i was really interested though actually on courtney's take because you know they didn't just look at the user experience they didn't just consider the features internally um they really focused on the client experience now clearly it was a client tool that they were looking for but you know they'd done some um testing and they sort of really used a focus group and got their feedback, a bit like you were talking about with tech in the last episode, but got their feedback and then used them to test as part of the phase out and, the, and rolling it out. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. We don't ask our clients to participate in these things nearly as much as we probably could. We, we, yeah, it, this is... This is actually all the same. I love this, right? Yeah. I love this. There's two comments. One, this is just think of this as risk management. That's all it right. is, right? Because what you don't want is to invest all this time and you roll it out and your clients revolt. Go, right? yeah. So that's that's what we're managing, right? So yeah. you, don't, you don't necessarily want to say, don't necessarily want to take all their feedback as gospel, but you, what you are checking is that this isn't going to put anything at risk. Because right? I think actually a lot of advisors would think the worst thing for something like a client, client portal was they don't use it. That's not the worst thing. No. The worst thing is they go, that sucks yeah. and I'm not sure yeah. I like you anymore. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think you suck now. <laughs> right. You know? So, that's the nightmare scenario. Yes. But I, don't, I think that's rare. But yeah. We're being using hyperbole, of course. Yes. But, uh, look, it's just good risk management. But yeah. I think also the really important thing that's, that's got that's rattling around in my head is this is where the warfare is going to be, right? So right. The client experience around tech is gearing is gearing up right so the what the client portal i think are amongst platforms and software alike historically has been a bit of a afterthought yeah and there's a lot of advisors historically were like i don't like that my clients having the portal because it can create they can check their uh balance turns and balances yep, yep, too often yep. and it creates overhead and work and yeah you know too much information can be a problem and yep. i kind of see that yeah but the world has moved well past mm -hmm. that now. Like so, um, immediacy of information is going to become critical. Yeah. So the idea of tech being vetted by investors, I just love this yeah. idea, right? So yeah. where I feel like we're we're building for the right people, and we're starting to get really user centric through all of that. So I, yeah. I think this is going to be the way. And it is interesting because when I think about it years ago, client portals or any sort of client-facing tech in that respect, it still was always about us. 
like we were telling them about us. We never really focused on them. Mm. Now, how is this capturing their life? How is they really involved in their life? We were relying on them to be so fascinated by their super or, or investments that they'd want to go into this thing. I'm like, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Who are we kidding, right? Oh, I agree. And you're going to start me on a rant here. <laughs> uh, this is the problem with portals everywhere. Right. I mean, our record is benchmarks and returns yeah. is not... What people? No one walks down the street going, "Geez, I wonder how I'm going." Versus the Morningstar balanced growth yeah. X, right? It's yeah, not happening. But one thing that we're working on at the moment is building goals in. So we've got goals in our in your plan. Yeah, and in the fact fund, you capture goals, you write about them, you talk about them, and as soon as a client portal or reporting comes up, uh, everyone just starts introducing benchmarks, and everyone forgets about goals, and it drives me mad. Yeah, so. What we're actively working on is here's your goal that we spoke about. Yep. Put that in the portal, not just in the plan and in the in the in the modeling. Put it in the portal so that people can track their life rather right. than track the performance. Right? Yes. And uh, the industry is sat wi- wildly missing the mark, in my opinion, on yeah. in most portals. Yeah, because I mean that's where they're at. Let's yeah. talk about their life. Yeah. Like, let's, yeah. let's Everyone wants them to in talk about life. themselves. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing in implementation, and I'm betting there's lots of people listening thinking, this is great, folks, but at the minute I implement, I'm going to have to deal with moving data. This is going to be, I'm yeah. going to have to strip it out of one system and put it in the other. And, and like uh, data extraction, I mean, poor Andrew and his team had some pretty hor- horrible or difficult, sorry, challenges there, but it wouldn't mm. necessarily be that big for most. Mm. It's still a fear. And it's still a challenge, it right? It's been done badly historically. Mm. So w- my advice would be this. First, speak to, ask to speak to two planners that have done it right. ahead of you, right? And then ask that that has been good. So ask, don't ask for a terrible experience because <laughs> anyone can replicate that, right? Yeah. But ask for someone who had a really good experience. And we've got one advisor who speaks on our behalf all the time around the – because he went on holidays and then it was in and it was right. Right, oh, wow. So he just went away. We did it in January and he came back and he was laughing. So he speaks about it, but he runs a really clean, like he takes care of his data. Okay, he's got really. Um, it's important. He was. Yeah. He was. Um, uh, he had. He st- steered clear of too much customized fields. So okay. when you're on our side of the fence, yeah, you build tools that can extract from every provider. We've got a midwinter one, advisor logic one, and explain one. Yeah, that. So if someone comes from them, we can run it. But. If you've built out all this stuff that is completely unique to you, that's where the challenges lie. Okay. So you, what I would suggest is cut straight. Don't ask questions about the names and addresses coming over. That's easy. Yeah. Right? And the assets coming over from the data feed, that's easy. Yeah. That can be done. It's the weirdness, right? right. So the, all the customization is where the, where the rubber hits the road. So yeah. I would just cut straight to if you're looking at your tech, look for the fields that you've invented. Okay. Because there's no tool that will sit outside of your world that will have them mapped. Yep. And if they, you can live without them, fine. Yeah. If you can't, then it's going to start getting A more process. complex. Okay. So that's the that's the conversation to lead with. And look, I guess um, sometimes, you know, the, in that process at the end, there'll be something that's going to be manual. Like um, we've had that with our data, with, like you say, and particularly if you've got a text field that people have filled with all sorts of information, like that's just horrible. Free form, yeah. Right? Free form yeah. text is yeah. like the, the, the end of the world in these <laughs> yeah. scenarios. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, as part of the implementation, you've just got to throw a resource at these things. Like you'll just get to a point where, okay, I just need somebody to look at that thing and check what it is or, you know, implement it here, those sort of things. Yeah. Then you can just get temp resources to help with this yep. stuff. I think we're, you know, it'd be great if we could press a button and zap. And like you say, if your data is very clean and very sanitized, yeah. you know, no free form fields other, other than the agreed one, the address, those sort of things. But most of us don't have that. Most of us have some yeah. things that we've done. So, you know, if you've got to throw some junior resources at it or even get in, you know, an intern or something like that to yeah. just handle some of it, then it, I think people shouldn't be afraid of that. They shouldn't be afraid of it. But I, I think the concern comes when it's you get data migration shock. Like you right. said, you haven't asked questions and perhaps we, have, like we as in the software yep. industry, hasn't been as forthcoming about this will come over and this won't. Right. And then you come over and you've got to work it out that you've got some Go. fields are missing and then yep. that's a problem. Yeah, That's when the problems are right. So yep. if you go in eyes wide open, 
th- these things can be done, but yes. we just need to have a conversation that's detailed. <laughs> yes, about about what it is, uh, what your life looks like, yeah. and then what will come over, and where yeah. any gaps might be. And I guess that also brings up, you know, we've consistently been saying you've got to take your staff on this journey then the people that have a really clear view of all of that data is more likely to be support staff than advisors. So making sure that deep discussion with the tech provider has some of those support staff in that room because they'll be able to say, oh, no, no, we use that for this or that, you know, so they'll probably have those insights over anybody else. 100%. Perfect. Well, this is exciting. Next up, we've got our final episode where we talk about ongoing management with tech. I'll look forward to seeing you then. Thanks. Thanks.